Welcome to the Speech Bag Podcast by Liberties, where we take a deep dive into the issues that affect your rights and your world. I'm Jonathan Day. On this episode... Now we have such an increase in the online traffic that we need to make rules that put order into chaos. And, and that is what the Digital Service Act uh, is all about. Uh, creating new rules, uh, making the online world a, a safe, a reliable, secure space for users of digital roads. That was European Commission Executive Vice President Margaret Vestager introducing the Draft Digital Services Act, or DSA, in 2020. Earlier this month, the final law cleared its last legislative hurdle and is now set to enter into force later this year. The DSA is being hailed as groundbreaking, the first serious attempt to rein in big tech and limit many of the behaviors, practices, and policies that people find burdensome, threatening, or downright illegal. To take a closer look at exactly how the DSA will break new ground and what it means for people, I speak with member of the European Parliament Alexandra Giese, who is a central figure in negotiating the final law, and Aliska Pirkova of the digital rights group Access Now, who has followed the lawmaking process closely and advocated for the strongest possible set of human rights safeguards in the DSA. <laughs> Alexandra Giese is a German member of the European Parliament from the Greens. She's been deeply involved with the Digital Services Act from its earliest days and served as European Parliament Rapporteur for the Greens during the decisive negotiations to finalize the law earlier this year. Let's go back to that night, or morning I should say really, because it's nearly 2.30 a.m. on April 23rd, and you tweet deal exclamation mark done exclamation mark hashtag DSA exclamation mark. It's a short tweet, but it's one that seems bursting with excitement and and also perhaps a sense of relief even. You spent years working on the Digital Services Act, and at that moment, you finally had a final law. What was it like? There was a lot of relief that it was finally done. Yes, definitely. And the, the feeling that this is really landmark legislation Absolutely, because we are the first democratic continent that comes up with platform regulation. And that platform regulation moves away from the paradigm that we need to regulate and moderate content and really looks at what the platforms themselves are doing. So in the beginning of of the conversation, it was all focused on we have to get rid of harmful content. And it was all about liability of the platforms for users content. And now the DSA managed to shift the focus to really holding the platforms accountable for what they do and not for the user's opinion. And therefore there was huge relief that this was actually done. And I think in record time, on the same t- at the same time, at that particular moment, I was a little bit disappointed because I think we could have had more. Um, For example, the wording on advertising and the use of sensitive data could have been a lot lot better. And I had also fought together with the parliament's majority for additional provisions to prevent image-based sexual violence on porn platforms, which seemed something everybody basically agreed to. And in the end, it didn't end up in the DSA. So that was my personal frustration that night. So uh, actually, while everybody, you know, was having champagne and celebrating, I was a little bit angry. But at the same time, I, I was aware that this is really, really landmark legislation. You mentioned advertising just now, and more specifically targeted advertising, the using of people's personal data, often without their knowledge, to target them with certain advertisements for products or or even disinformation. It's certainly one of the main focus areas when it comes to DSA, but it's also one where DSA is at once considered groundbreaking and, uh, as you've said, a glass half full uh, sort of thing. Yeah. Um, What I fought for and what the parliament, uh, no, what I fought for was a total ban of surveillance advertising. So advertising should not be based on on our personal data, especially not on these really huge, huge, huge profiles with huge amount of inferred data about everything we do and we are. Um, because there is 
uh, a, a viable alternative, which is called contextual advertising, which would allow exactly for the same amount. It's not that advertising goes away because the, ad, the internet has to be funded some way. There needs to be a business model, but contextual would work with the data um, related to the website. You're looking at the content you are looking at and not with who you are. So that just as, as the first um, premise, and that would help to tackle other issues like, like the, the dissemination of, of um, hateful speech, for example, of disinformation, also brand safety for big advertisers. It would have fixed a lot of issues. This switch from surveillance advertising to contextual advertising has been resisted and fought against for a while now, with advertising being so central to the business models of Meta and the other large online platforms. I imagine this was an issue of fairly intense lobbying and debate. That was the really the one issue um, the corporations lobbied against. It was this one thing, Meta and Google were really, really vocal about this um, on social media. Um, they, they even had these, um, they had this huge campaign saying this is good for small and medium enterprises, taking example from small companies who, according to them, could not live without surveillance advertising, which is totally ridiculous. But this was really talking points. Even the commission picked up um, as some of you may know, Google, Meta, or Amazon fund every every single think tank you have here in Brussels. They do fund a lot of universities. The, all the most prestigious universities who work on digital topics are heavily Google or Meta funded. So it was very difficult to hear independent voices. And considering that total asymmetry, I think what we got in the end was not back. Um, the Parliament's plenary voted um, for a ban of the use of data of minors for advertising purposes. Um, also, I think following a little bit the revelations of Facebook whistleblower Francis Hogan, who explained how Instagram lures uh, 13, 14 year old girls into anorexia uh, accounts in a, in a really, really shameful way. Um, I have mothers whose daughters have died because of this. And I'm very passionate about this. Um, and this is what we managed to carry through Trilog. So we have a prohibition to use the data of minors for advertising. Uh, that's the first limitation we put into place. The second one is the use of sensitive data, according to GDPR. Uh, sensitive data card categories are things like um, political orientation, sexual orientation, religious faith, um, trade union membership, or health data. Also, if you you know look at depression sites, often for example, which is something you know very much quoted example, um, because then platforms know you're probably a vulnerable person. Mental health is really a huge issue in terms of how algorithms are used. So that data should not have been what the parliament originally said is you can target people on the basis of this of these these sensitive data categories for advertising what the text now says it's you can't have that information in your profile which is a little bit different so i'm a little bit i'm worried about how this wording is going to play out because there is a difference and there was quite you know, the French presidency really, really insisted on having this wording and not the parliament's one, uh, which I thought was worrying. <laughs> and the fact is my legal experts right now can't really tell how this is going to play out. We feel it's a limitation compared to what the parliament wanted. It's weaker, but we'll have to see, you know, what the DPAs and the courts are going to say. I think the, the most important thing is not how is this going to play out, you know, in the first three months of the implementation of the DSA, but the fact that we are sending the message. We are sending the message. We are understanding. We're starting to understand what your business model is about. We do feel uncomfortable with you collecting all this data and using this for advertising, and we are limiting it. Alishka Pirkova is the Europe Policy Analyst at Access Now, an international civil society organization that defends digital rights. Surveillance advertising has long been an issue that she's closely watched, and this is especially so when it comes to the DSA. And while it could have been better and the language could have been stronger, she says there's reason to be happy with how DSA tackles targeting. 
civil societies have been fighting very hard for having uh, the ban on targeting and amplification uh, within the DSA. And when these conversations started, uh, we were very skeptical that we will ever succeed. And there was really a number of civil society players who've been working very hard on this element of the DSA. And now we do have a ban on targeting and amplification using special categories of sensitive data. It's a major step forward, even though uh, civil society organizations that led on these work had more ambitious measures in mind. Uh, and so what we ended up with is still quite limited, but it's a very, uh, because as we know, um, this is only a partial victory because there are targeting techniques that are not based on sensitive data and they still remain highly intrusive. But it's a first important step to effectively tackle negative impact of surveillance-based advertisement and platforms business model. And I think it's a very important victory to celebrate, even though it's not exactly what we have hoped for. But a couple of years ago, we wouldn't even dream of having such a good starting point in the legally binding legis legislation at the EU level. So I want to really emphasize this uh, because the reason why we have this measure in the DSA is mainly due to the uh, hard work of civil society organizations, as well as members of the European Parliament who have always been fully aware of the danger that stems from business models of platforms and which is pretty much the starting point or lies in the core of many issues that DSA seeks to tackle. Surveillance advertising, the techniques used, how our data is used, uh, this has always been kind of an opaque area. Sort of an example of how very large online platforms operate with very little transparency in, in advertising, but also in terms of how they curate and moderate content and many other areas. And DSA promises to make the internet safer and more enjoyable, in large part by, by going after illegal content. Um, but in order to regulate these platforms, don't we have to understand them first, to put it plainly? It feels like transparency is not only an area where people want more, it sort of feels like one where we, we really need it. Does DSA address this? We have to realize that uh, to this day, Transparency is uh, given by platforms voluntarily. Uh, so they disclose information about their systems and processes that they deploy, whether for content moderation or for content curation, based on their free will. So if they like to uh, inform us about how the system works through their transparency report, they do so. But they also withhold a lots of important information uh, that um, prevents us from having a clear picture about what they actually do with our content uh, and definitely uh, users like any meaningful information to understand why they see some information more often than others in their news feeds for instance or how decisions about content that they shared on those platforms um, how do, how actually the, how that content is being regulated so why certain things stay online and why something is being removed and on what basis and DSA is changing this. Um, it establishes legally binding transparency and something that we also called algorithmic accountability. Um, and through these enhanced transparency rules that it will be now legally binding for platforms, so it won't be only a choice anymore, um, uh, the DSA will require from platforms to disclose, for instance, the number of removal orders that were issued by national authorities, but that were also uh, submitted by um, trusted flaggers or by other users about the presence of illegal content on the platform or something that they deem illegal. And the DSA will oblige platforms to actually publicly report on those information, not only in terms of numbers, so how many pieces of content uh, were removed, but also on their automated content moderation tools, how many mistakes these content moderation tools make, but also very detailed information about how these tools are being trained on what data and for instance what type of assistance platforms provide to their content moderators and what kind of training these content moderators receive whether they understand the local context properly which is always very important for protection of freedom of speech 
but whether they also receive human rights training um, to in order to really strike the balance without unjustifiably restricting people's rights. These transparency requirements, especially regarding the algorithms used to moderate content, are critical if the DSA is to achieve one of its central aims, getting rid of illegal content. Done properly, the internet is a safer and better place. But done improperly and lots of lawful content, free speech, is blocked. MAP Gizes says that one of the things DSA gets right is that it doesn't overreach in its drive to stamp out illegal content. I think what is good is that the DSA focuses and is limited in, in, in as far as the, the moderation of content that is of specific pieces um, of information is concerned, um, is limited to illegal content. Before, there had been a lot of call, quite a lot of calls to also regulate harmful content, um, especially strongly in my country, Germany, but also other countries um, said, well, you know, if you want to get rid of disinformation, just tell platforms to get rid of it and they have to, to moderate content, especially disinformation. Um, and there's clearly no, it, it's very difficult to decide what exactly is disinformation, um, when is it actually harmful, where is the line between people being badly informed or holding extreme opinions and disinformation that is extremely difficult to determine. And I think there are just huge risks and something that at the same time nobody really wanted was, was a sort of ministry of truth that decides what we can read and what we can't read. So I think that is really good. Um, we also, for the first time, have a European-wide notification procedure for illegal content that users can use. Um, we are sorry that some of the safeguards we as Greens wanted to build in weren't accepted, for example, the, the possibility to notify illegal content anonymously which is important in the case of hateful speech. If you are the victim or a potential victim, you don't want your name all over the place. And we know there have been breaches of, um, of privacy. Uh, Facebook has had huge leaks. Um, if, there is, um, if this gets notified to the police, your name will be on the file. So if you are a victim or a potential victim of violence, which you probably are if you're notifying hateful speech, um, that might be dangerous and it might be disincentive to notify speech, so illegal speech. So this is something we would have wanted and we did not get because I think the other parties didn't see the urgency and the need for this. Um, on the bright side, I think we have notification procedures. We have the enforcement um, of a clear procedures for the enforcement of orders by administrative and judicial authorities in the member states. Um, this has two sides too. We, we do have to say, because this can be abused obviously, and as Greens we wanted a particular procedure for countries that are, no, uh, are under an Article 7 procedure. In other words, Poland and Hungary, against whom the Article 7 procedure, which could lead to the countries losing their EU voting rights, was launched in 2017 and 2018, respectively, for continued violations of rule of law and EU values. These are governments that harass independent journalists, human rights workers, environmental activists, LGBTQI people, migrants, and other groups. And so preventing the DSA from becoming misused by these governments is paramount. We don't want every Hungarian or Polish policeman to be able to inquire um, who has posted certain kinds of content because that could go against LGBTIQ people, for example, migrants, for example. So there were concerns. On the other hand, you can't stop democratic states and judicial authorities from enforcing their laws just because you have issues in two countries you can't solve. Looking at this issue from the perspective of a user who uploads content that is incorrectly flagged as illegal and then taken down, something that's becoming increasingly common, the DSA makes the internet a much better place. It does this by establishing a set of users' rights, which Eliska Pirkova says will empower everyday internet users. What the DSA does is that it actually enables individuals to better access effective remedies. Uh, there are several layers how DSA does that. Um, a first layer could be that intermediaries will be now obliged to establish a single point of contact for direct communication between them and their users. 
Um, so in case uh, a platform restricts their piece of content, uh, they will be obliged to provide a statement of reason explaining what type of action was taken and on what basis. So if a content violates their terms of service, they will now have to explain to users what part of terms of service and why. And also it establishes a new grievance mechanism. So how can actually users seek effective remedy and what are their channels to, to go through in order to obtain that effective remedy? Uh, the ESA foresees internal complaint handling system, uh, which will be provided directly by platforms free of charge. Um, and it also offers so-called out-of-court dispute settlement, um, which will be enabled or users will have access to this dispute settlement in case uh, their, uh, the, the internal complaint uh, handling system did not exactly help them or their case was not properly resolved at that, let's call it for now, first instance. These two grievance mechanisms will mainly consider uh, those violations or alleged violations uh, of terms of service of platforms. So if the content is being removed because it violated somehow those uh, terms of service that platforms have in place. And of course, uh, there is then the right to access a judicial redress that must always be available uh, in every single member state. So users should always have an access to the independent and impartial courts that will then decide on their case. Does the DSA spell out how this judicial redress can be accessed? It, it seems like an area where, despite the good intentions, people could not be able to exercise this option or at least struggle very much to do so. DSA is quite silent on how these judicial redress can be or should be accessed by individuals. And we know, uh, based on experience, that this is usually exactly that, that aspect, which, which is very difficult for users to reach. Uh, so not every user has means uh, to actually go and sue Meta for unjustifiably restricting their freedom of speech. And very often those cases that we see, uh, many of those actually concern uh, important public figures and politicians who have time, resources, uh, and then very often their own personal agenda to actually bring these cases to the court. Uh, so that's definitely something BSA could do better. Something I'd like to ask you about is related to automated content moderation and really everything we've spoken about, and that's the new due diligence obligations in the DSA. I'd like to get your thoughts on it, but to me, it, it seems like another thing that really, really breaks new ground. Due diligence safeguards are indeed, at least for me, one of the most novel and progressive uh, elements of the DSA. Uh, it, the reason for that is the due diligence obligations for very large online platforms um, fully address the issue of uh, moving away from those bad regulatory practices in the area of content governance that we saw for many years, um, such as focusing on concrete categories of content that have to be swiftly removed from platforms, usually in a highly non-transparent manner outside of any public scrutiny and under extremely strict and disproportionate uh, deadlines. Um, and as an example, the infamous Avia law in France that was fortunate, unfortunately struck down by the National Constitutional Council, that's a good example of that bad lawmaking. In early 2020, France intended to implement a law to stop online hate speech. Known as the Avia law, it included severe standards that needed to be met, like a 24-hour window to take down anything flagged as illegal content, which could have led to countless lawful uploads being taken down in error, a huge blow to free speech. In June of that year, the Constitutional Council ruled that the main provisions in the law were unconstitutional, saying they were breaching the right to freedom of expression and opinion. Due diligence safeguards force VLOP to actually unpack those processes for individuals as well as for public regulators uh, in order for us to truly understand those systemic risks that actually stem from those processes. Very large online platforms, or VLOPs, are defined in the DSA as being those with 45 million or more monthly active users. So due diligence safeguards include uh, things like mandatory risk assessment, and consequently, uh, deployment of mitigation of risk measures, which means in practice that platforms will be obliged to conduct these risk assessments 
in order to understand those risks that stem from uh, their systems and processes for users' fundamental rights. And consequently, they will have to put in place measures that will mitigate those risks. And how accessible are these risk assessments, that data and analysis? It would seem rather important for independent experts, civil society, and others to be able to, to really pour over that work. Another very important element of due diligence is data access framework for vetted researchers and NGOs. So now we don't have to beg anymore for, plat- for platforms to release those data, but we will have a legal access to them. And again, how that will exactly work in practice and making it truly meaningful will depend on how this measure is being enforced and how the compliance with its rules is being uh, monitored. As groundbreaking as the DSA is for digital rights, and it truly is, there are some important areas where safeguards are lacking or don't go far enough. One of them involves so-called dark patterns. These are things like the intentionally deceptive cookie consent process we see so often or bait and switch schemes advertised to internet shoppers. MEP Giza, I know that this is an area of much debate and one where people were really hoping for some action. But despite the DSA containing a general ban on dark patterns, you're not exactly celebrating here. This was a big fight and there I feel we are rather on the losing side actually. Because we do have an article against dark patterns, which says that dark patterns are banned and the commission will come up with a specific list. But there's also a paragraph B that says this article doesn't apply to anything that falls under either GDPR, so the General uh, Data Protection Regulation, which covers cookie banners or the Unfair Trade Practice Directive, which in theory covers basically everything else. So especially if you, if you want to purchase something in the internet, which is the other case where dark patterns are used to you know, nudge you to, to sign a contract or something and give up your rights. Um, and that means I, I really don't know, and I think very, very few people at the moment know if anybody which dark patterns will not fall under one of these two provisions or the directive or the regulation. That feels extremely frustrating to, on the one hand, say dark patterns are banned, and then on the other to say, well, except for in this case and this case. That is very frustrating because I was one of the um, people who said, well, You know, I know cookie cookie banners are regulated by GDPR, but GDPR was was clearly written for different times and different circumstances and not for a world controlled by a duopoly where you basically don't don't have choice. You know, GDPR was written for a world where you have a choice between giving up your data or not. GDPR also contains data minimization and GDPR was thought for a world where GDPR is actually enforced against everybody the same way, which is not the case today because it's like Facebook's X-Files. Um, if you live in a, in, a, in a member state where GDPR is enforced, there are a lot of practices you can't do, especially dark patterns. If you're headquartered in Ireland, you can because the Irish Deep Data Protection Authority has been very sympathetic towards Google and Facebook who basically hold the monopoly over cookie banners with the um, transparency and consent framework, which has been found to be not complying with GDPR in Belgium. And... So here I feel we have the article, but we don't have the substance actually. And it's, it's really frustrating because we keep giving up, you know, making really, really good legislation in Europe and then giving up the data to a couple of companies, basically Google, Google and Matter. And you can't avoid it. I mean, I just, went, I just went to a restaurant to have lunch and I wasn't given a paper menu, but a QR code. So I scanned the QR codes to choose my lunch and I have to agree to the cookies. So it's, you know, accept or get further information, get lost in the internet. And since I'm aware of these issues, uh, which is already, you know, a very different situation for most people, I, I click on get lost in the internet and get me, help me to get rid of these cookies. 
And then at a certain point, I can deactivate them one by one. It's not refuse all. It's just like three or four. I have to deactivate. I click confirm, save and exit. And I go back to the initial page, which says, would you like to accept the cookies or would you, you know, get lost in the internet? So I still don't see my menu. And in the end, you know, my partner says, come on, stop it. This is the menu. I accept that the cookie is read it from here. But, you know, and I started, well, that's not the point. And this is what happens to everybody 300 times a day. So that's really not the solution. But there is a big discussion taking place also in the GDPR uh, advocates community. So, well, the problems that are inherent to GDPR have to be fixed within, you have to fix GDPR and not come up with new legislation. The reaction from digital and human rights groups was certainly not one of celebration over the purported ban of dark patterns. While some say it at least represents progress, uh, a further acknowledgement of the problems and threats, many others are calling it essentially hollow. Alishka, what is your take? So I think that the truth is somewhere in between. Um, first, I think it is a win for people's rights and their online experience that that measure exists. Uh, so indeed, we now have the measure that tackles or wants to or seeks to tackle dark patterns or decept deceptive design practices deployed by platforms. And it does so at least to some extent. Um, however, um, how, you know, whether, whether these measures actually contain any added value uh, in comparison to already existing measures that also fight against dark patterns and uh, different um, uh, dis deceptive design. Unfortunately, here I'm also a little bit more skeptical. Of course, like any law, DSA can only be truly effective if it is properly enforced. This will be a job both for the European Commission and at national level. And, of course, civil society will monitor enforcement every step of the way. Eliska, in some sense, it's no rest for the weary for you, having just spent years working on the DSA's legislative process and now the huge and hugely important process of enforcing the regulation. What will you be focusing on specifically here? We have a lot of work ahead of us, to say the least. Um, there are a number of issues that civil societies will have to tackle, as well as other independent stakeholders with the relevant expertise. Um, because the enforcement is truly, a, um, it's a bit of a monster to start with. DSA foresees the enforcement at the national level, which will be done through so-called digital service coordinators. And here is the first danger where, of course, we have countries where we can count on the strong rule of law and democratic principles and independence of public authorities. And we have also countries in the EU where their national regulators already have experience with governing platforms such as Meta. But then we have countries that either lack experience, resources for their national regulators, and on the top of it are, you know, governed by rather authoritarian forms of governance, um, to put it very lightly. Um, and this will definitely cause lots of obstacles in following years. And that's why it will be very important for us to monitor that enforcement and making sure that DSA is just not a law that looks good on the paper because its practical implications are very much dependent on the successful enforcement model. And we don't have exactly positive experience from the GDPR where DG just hardly ever or in a very limited manner tries to bring claims against national uh, data protection authorities for not properly enforcing the law. Uh, so centralized enforcement does not necessarily mean faster procedures. Uh, or more effective enforcement mechanism. Um, but at the same time, while being critical of the system and of the lack of independence of the European Commission, we of course wish that we will be wrong and that the system will work very well. It's just at the moment rather a new experiment that the European Commission is doing. Um, and hopefully it will work well, but we also have to be fully aware of dangers that actually stem from that type of enforcement mechanism. For its part, the commission has decided to dedicate a team of, I, I think it's a couple of hundred people in Brussels. And to be honest, 
that doesn't sound like a lot. A couple of hundred against all the staff and all of the resources of the Metas and, and the Googles of the world. Is this the number and, and is it enough? Um, so now we know that for both DSA and DMA, the commission intends to hire around new 220 staff members for both legislation, while I think around 70 should be dedicated to Digital Services Act. Um, those are the numbers that, that we are now aware of. But there are other issues, like definitely skills and resources will be instrumental and speaking of resources, MAP Giza says this is one area where the DSA does include a very important provision. One thing that is extremely important is the article on the supervisory phase. That was originally a green idea that we brought into the, the amendment process in the parliament. It didn't find a majority in parliament. And the idea is, and then the commission came back up with it and was and that was backed by council and so found it way, its way through trilogue back into the text that the very large online platforms, only the very large ones, have to pay for their own supervision. So up to 0.05% of the turnover, and they have to pay for the actual cost of the supervision of the oversight, and that allows the commission um, to hire experts, to hire a sufficient number of experts, and also experts with a sufficient quality, and to pay them, uh, to, to, to pay them an income that is adequate to a market income. Because, you know, as Francis Hogan said, there are very few people in the world who are actually able to audit these companies who actually know how the algorithms work, what kind of data you have to look at, and you have to be able to get these people and to pay for them. And the platform themselves will have to pay the supervisory fees. So it's not on the taxpayer. You know, we're fighting against the harms that these platforms are causing, and that shouldn't be paid by taxpayers, but, the, but by the platforms themselves, as, exactly as it happens in the banking sector, for example. Given the huge task of enforcement and the rather worrisome experience of GDPR enforcement, for example, are you optimistic that things will go better with DSA's enforcement? Yeah, let, let's say I'm a natural optimist. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm quite optimistic. I think the current commission has quite, uh, well, quite a thorough understanding compared to regulators around the world of how this platform works. And I see some strong political will to, to go through with this. But obviously, the, the remaining mandate of this company uh, commission is two years, and then there will be next commission, and we don't know who the next commissioner will be. And that was my main criticism, and that's why I and my group, we argued for an independent oversight authority. We've had this idea for some time to have an independent European digital authority. Um, then, you know, the question is what, is, what exactly is digital? Everything's digital nowadays. But with the DSA, it's very clear that the better idea, rather than having a unit in the European Commission, would really to have an independent agency that is a lot more independent from political will and political um, intentions and interests and so on. So you don't have capitals, national capitals coming in, maybe the interests of a specific commissioner. As I said, with this commission, I don't see huge issues, but who knows who the next commissioner will be. That's it for this episode of the Speech Bag Podcast by Liberties. If you have questions or comments, drop us a line at podcast at liberties.eu. This has been a presentation of the Civil Liberties Union for Europe.